Okay, so each of the processes there uh, emits CO2 and requires energy, right? Your iron ore uh, sintering plant, that requires a lot of energy, and that requires energy as well. And the, the other thing about coking plants is that they're very um, expensive. You have to use a high quality um, coal and then you make it into um, coke and then um, basically the uh, steel making plant wants to get rid of as much of these bits as possible, right? The blast furnace, this side of things, um, this is well known technology and they um, don't really know how to get away with it, they're um, thinking about getting uh, you know, ways to get rid of this, but the easiest way to decarbonize this is to do CCS on this. Take the CO2 that you've got coming out from the process and strip it away, right? The coke and the iron ore sintering process can be got rid of via a Corex plant or a Hisana plant. They're two different types of new iron making processes which are currently being demonstrated by well within the EU um, each of them because they get rid of this part of the process so they they integrate quite well with um, what's going on because they get rid of this part of the process they make they get rid of about 30 percent of the emissions if you then integrate the whole system with CCS right you're going to get rid of about 70 to 80 percent of the emissions but because you've got so many um, sources within the process, it's extremely difficult to get rid of all of the emissions from, uh, from steel making, right? There's lots of things that are going on and each of these bits actually um, produces CO2. So for DRI, so <clears throat> you've got your sintered uh, material, you've got your blast furnace and the blast furnace You've got quite a lot of carbon monoxide coming off with your um, uh, gases that are coming off. So it's unused carbon monoxide, which um, was you know, coming from your um, highly expensive coke. So one of the things I like to do, one of the things that's proposed is to take, the C is to take this off gas, recycle it round, take the CO2 out of the off gas, and use that as a direct reductant to put that in right at the bottom of the um, blast furnace. And because you're getting rid of the expensive coke, which takes a lot of energy as well to make, that gives you about a 15% um, saving on your blast furnace, even if you're um, uh, not doing CCS with the CO2. Right? So you can take the CO2 off as well. You can do CCS, but if you're doing some sort of recycling, you um, can get rid of quite a lot that way. Um, that's basically that. Right, okay, so it's a different way to produce your um, iron. So the first thing you need to do is to, to produce iron from your iron ore. And the way you can do that is through direct reduced iron. You can do this with um, hydrogen, directly reduce it, and then put that into your blast furnace, or you can put that directly into an electric arc furnace. Now, put it, wor working out new ways to use electric arc furnaces is another pretty useful thing in the future, right? What's this? Why do you actually still, uh, to me, the blast furnace was always the reducer, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, you're mainly, you're mainly, oh, I shouldn't really have that in. You're mainly going into the electric arc furnace, right? You're mainly, if you're gonna do DRE. That, that kind of yeah. But then you have to then you have to take it out again with the oxygen. Fit. You have to get the right amount in. Right amount. Take out you take out as much of the carbon as you can. Two percent. Yeah. So you've got different routes to get rid of the sintering process um, and to eliminate as much as possible of the coke that you're using. You've got different routes to um, do carbon capture on the system, either just doing carbon capture on the coke, uh, sorry, on the um, top gas that's coming off from your process, or thinking about combining different uh, streams. You've got the, if you've got a coking system in there, you're probably gonna burn your uh, coke gas somewhere else in your um, plant, 
and then you need to do carbon capture on the coke gas. So you've got lots of different sources within the um, system that you need to get rid of. But there's different technologies that can do these. For the um, electric arc furnace, there's the 30% of um, uh, CO2 production or 30% uh, uh, of iron, uh, steel production. You start out with scrap. The issue with um, starting out with scrap is that, say, Germany now has about 90% um, recycling rates, so we can't actually up the amount of scrap that we're using um, too much. I mean, everybody can do a bit better, but we can't get um, too much better. Developing technology to do DRI would be very useful, so better ways to get into um, here. And then a big thing is looking at how flexibly you can operate your electric arc furnace, whether or not you can ramp it up and down to act as a um, electricity, uh, well, to, to even out your electricity load. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the iron and steel stuff. Is there any thought to a completely carbon-free steel manufacturing? You're, you depended on CCS to scrub the tail, but if you never had it except what was incorporated into the steel to begin with, is that you wouldn't need to do that. Is there any drawing board scheme by which you could the, support such a process? The easiest way would be to be doing direct redu reduction with hydrogen right. and then electric arc furnace. Right. And is that um, something that people are working on and developing? All of these things. So that's the Ulco Red process, right? So the um, ultra low CO2 steel consortium is about 15 um, different sets of people in the EU who are looking at reducing um, emissions of uh, CO2 from steel production, right? And so the Ulco Red is the DRI. Um, the Hisana is also developed by the Ulcos um, Consortium. And they're being, so Hisana is being demonstrated now at Imugen in the Netherlands, and Corex is being demonstrated. Corex has actually been demonstrated in a couple of places at plant scale. So there are things that are um, being done, but, um, you know, to get the big wins in terms of CO2 um, reduction, you do need to go to CCS. But, but I'd say there's also a policy component to this because when you build a steel plant, an integrated steel mill, figure 50 to 75 year lifetimes. Yeah. If you go to Gary, Indiana plant where 45,000 people used to work, it kind of looks the same as it did when 45,000 people worked there. And China has just built out an enormous number of steel mills. So this is where policy is going to have to play a role because it's try to beat that sunk capital uh, in, in, in sort of a ton per ton cost basis is going to be a pretty big stretch. And also the Chinese, the Chinese plants are actually pretty efficient. It's yeah. something that people sort of say, ah, oh, well, you know, the Chinese are um, building iron and steel and we can't com compete with them because they don't pay their workers. No, it's because they've got new plants that are highly efficient mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. that's why they're, um, Good. you know. I would not be, bear in mind, I'm not the world expert on uh, iron and steel. I think there might be, but I wouldn't be able to. Uh, it would be consistent with hydrogen reduction, you would be doing it a little. <laughs> so that, that, I think what, 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 this. I think we're supposed to go to the next one. one. Yeah. And then let's, let's, right. He's doing them both now because we lost the steel person at the last minute. And so we're going to do them both and then have the speakers up because you want to know about Okay, so onto a process that I am a little bit more uh, expert in. Right, so I was asked to talk about um, cement and also um, heavy industry as well, so I'll just l leak a little bit into heavy industry. Um, first thing. Uh, to do is to sort of say, well, why, you know, what, what actually do, does industry perceive as the um, issues with carbon capture and storage, with decarbonisation? And overwhelmingly, when you actually ask them, so about uh, two years ago I did a um, big um, questionnaire and got, you know, quite a few people to uh, respond. Economics, 
I know we're not supposed to make, mention economics too much, is the big driver of um, why people are worried about doing carbon capture and storage or anything like that on cement plants. Reason would be cement plants are actually very, very, very simple and they don't have that much going on. So to add on quite a complicated um, chemical process on the end of that starts to make them quite uh, twitchy. Anyway, um, they also were worried about long-term governmental um, uh, regulatory stability and making sure that uh, you know, the, the rules aren't going to change every five minutes. Right. Infrastructure and access to storage, big issue as well. Anyway, we'll assume that those are um, sorted out. Um, we look to the costs of CCS for a number of different industries. And within the, uh, within the bounds of a uh, fairly uh, comprehensive systematic review, um, we ended up looking at 200 different uh, sources, and we found about 80 to 90 dollars per ton for um, CO2 if you're doing amine scrubbing on most of the industries. Now, bear in mind that the industries are all fairly um, heterogeneous, so iron and steel, refineries, and cement. If you're doing amine scrubbing, that's about what it'll cost, right? Maybe a little bit more on uh, cement. But the key thing with industrial processes is that they're all different to each other, and many of them are set up differently to, um, well, uh, the, the sources of CO2. Some of them have high purity sources of CO2. Some of them have low purity sources of CO2. Some of them are high pressure. Some of them are low pressure. So what's right for one technology, or what's right for one um, process may be um, completely wrong for a different one. Now, focusing down on cement a little bit. Right, here's my cement plant, and there's two sources of emissions in here, right? There's energy going in here in my um, kiln. I've got a big flame about 1500 degrees C, which is performing clinkering reactions on calcium carbonate, which comes down here, and the spare, well, the heat that's uh, not uh, been used here comes up here and um, strips off CO2 to form calcium oxide. And we might have to put in a little bit of coal in here as well, but don't worry too much about that. So you've got tires, other things, right? tires, other things whatever, whatever. Biomass, right. The important thing is you've got direct emissions here of about half of the total emissions per ton of clinker that you produce, right? Direct emissions and uh, emissions from the fuel in the process, right? Now, this means because you've got so many direct emissions, you are pushed towards a carbon capture and storage type um, situation, right? So if we're going to have carbon capture and storage on our cement plants, we need to think about how we're going to do this best. Now, most people um, start out saying, well, amine scrubbing is a um, technology that's been around since God was small, and uh, why don't you just do amine scrubbing? We know how that works. The issue with amine scrubbing is that there's only about half of the low-grade heat within the system that you need to make aiming scrubbing cheap. Um, and therefore, that doesn't really work. That becomes extremely expensive, right? Um, the reason that aiming scrubbing works on a power station is because in the power station, you've got a big source of low-grade heat that you can divert steam from your... Um, uh, low pressure turbine, you can divert that into your um, regenerator if you're aiming scrubber. We don't have that in cement, so that doesn't work so well. Calcium looping, which I do quite a lot of work on, is basically you have calcium oxide, which is fantastic because you've got calcium carbonate to start with in your uh, cement plant. You have calcium oxide, you cycle it around in a loop, taking CO2 from the exhaust of your plant and Basically, um, you then heat it up again and uh, reject the CO2, and that goes into your CCS system. Right? So there's a loop there. That works very nicely because you've got um, your product from the system, your calcium oxide, or you know, one of the uh, 
uh, sorbents in your system. It's already on your plant and you can cycle it around nicely. The people that um, do cement you know, know how to do this. But there's issues with how trace elements may build up within the system. Um, when you're cycling around a sorbent on a repeated basis and you've got all these dirty tires and all this sort of rubbish in there, sometimes they'll pick up um, elements and accumulate them throughout the system. The other thing you can do is an oxyfuel kill, something that uh, Klaus uh, worked on about 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, that is where you basically take your flame and you um, burn, ox you use pure oxygen instead of um, air going into your process, probably with a little bit of recycled CO2 in the system. And that, um, at the end, basically, you've got oxygen and CO2 going in, and your coal and whatever, and then at the outlet, you've just got a pure stream of CO2. That has some big advantages in that the efficiency of the system can be very high because you're not heating up a whole load of air with your, um, with your oxygen, right? So you can go to, a, you can, you can de-bottleneck your kiln, you can do a whole load of extra stuff and it's quite efficient. But closing off a rotating kiln and stopping any air getting in is a hard proposition, right? And so that's in the level of, um, you know, stuff that I do in my lab at the moment. Direct capture, new, new um, concept where somebody is using um, essentially a new, really high-class quality alloy um, and heating it on the outside with gas or something like that. So you don't capture those emissions, the emissions that you're using for the fuel to um, affect the calcination in your process. So you can only do calcination emissions and you don't get uh, the, um, all of those, but it's a very simple and effective system. You just basically heat up a uh, tube to red hot, throw your um, calcium carbonate through, it calcines, it's got CO2, um, uh, it's just a mixture of CO2 and calcium oxide, and then you're um, fine. So, barriers to decarbonisation, um, it's a very conservative industry. Um, nobody wants cement manufacturer to be a, you know, hey, let's go ahead, let's build some buildings and see whether they fall down. Um, some guys I was talking to sort of said to me um, in the industry, build a bridge, see it stand up for 20 years, and then maybe we can talk about your new cement formulation, right? All of these, produce Portland cement, standard Portland cement, which is important, right? Lots of people suggest, hey, I've got a novel cement formulation and it takes up CO2 from the atmosphere and blah, blah, blah. Well, Portland cement takes up CO2 from the atmosphere. Over a geological time frame, actually, it carbonates a huge amount, right? But um, it has the advantage of being Portland cement. Right. Big issue, low margin product, right? and easily shipped around from one country to another. So you've got to have some sort of regulatory regime where you've got tariffs on CO2 emissions before you can um, uh, suggest that one set of people need to do this and other people around the world don't. Um, in particular issues for CCS, the sources are generally smaller than you would have for a power, power station. The equivalent size of a cement works is about a 200 megawatt coal-fired power station, so small. So you're not going to want to put in a dedicated pipeline for this anywhere. You need to have a backbone of power CCS going on to enable you to do this. Can you retrofit? When you put a new plant in place, the kiln's going to last 50 years. It's actually at the same point that Stephen was making. Right? The kiln lasts 50 years. If you don't get in at the right time to do the um, retrofit, you're having serious issues. Costs, this can nearly double the capex of your plant at the moment, right? So, yes, it's a, you know, these are great ideas, but basically only this one, the oxyfuel kiln, might give you a chance of not having a massive increase in your costs of cement. You're looking at maybe uh, doubling your capex, as I say. 
Right, my key thoughts on um, what we need to actually do for the future in both iron and steel and um, cement manufacture, we're not doing enough systems analysis of new and novel processes when linked in to um, uh, CCS or indeed to, to just thinking about how to, to make these uh, new things. The Ulcos Consortium does a lot of work on iron and steel and there are you know, different consortia demonstrating at least two of these, and actually three, this one's being demonstrated as well, um, around the world. However, demonstration is, is going to be key, but also thinking about new ways to actually produce iron and steel and cement integrated potentially with power. There's some fantastic power integration that you can do with um, a cement kiln with calcium looping. I won't go into the details. But the analyses are all being done by a very select group of people, the IEA um, and the Global Carbon, Ca uh, Global Carbon Capture and Storage Institute and um, uh, uh, ULCOS, right? There's very few independent analyses being done by people to get cost information out of the system, right? And with that, I think I'll um, stop.